Hello everyone, thanks for watching. I'm Jim Falk and today we're going to be talking about something that's very important and we all have one and that's our brain. Unlike most any other organ in our body, our brains are not preordained to wither away, lose power, blunt their edge, or worst of all, become forgetful. Well, that's according to CNN's chief medical correspondent, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Well, we're going to look under the hood today and see how you can measure your brain and also how you might just improve your brain health. And to do exactly that, we're joined by two experts from the Center for Brain Health at the University of Texas at Dallas. First, let's welcome Dr. Julie Frattatoni. She's a cognitive neuroscientist and a licensed speech language pathologist, and she heads up operations for the Brain Health Project. She's joined by her colleague, Dr. Jennifer Zines. She's the Deputy Director of Programs and Head of Clinical Services at the, and, and also holds a master's degree in speech pathology. Welcome to you both. It's great to have such renowned experts on the program. Thanks for having us. So I think one of the things that we all get confused about is really what is the definition of brain health? Yeah, I mean, typically it's defined as just the absence of disease, um, which we wouldn't define health for any other part of our body like that. And so we're defining brain health as really your capacity to thrive within your life context. And that incorporates so many aspects beyond just memory. So it's looking at things like social interactions, daily life, well-being, mood, sleep. Um, all of these aspects are important, um, as well as those higher level cognitive functions. And you're right, it's absolutely important, but we tend to just really look at the brain and think about the brain when we've had an accident or there's someone that we know has had a stroke. How do we move to that sort of next level? I think it's a really important thing to be thinking about how we are proactive about our own health, becoming our own best advocates, getting benchmarks. You know, every part of our body, we get baseline testing, but we don't ever do that for our brain. And so if we would, start to have this as part of our healthcare system and part of our you know, lifestyle medicine um, procedures and protocols, then I think things could shift. And that's exactly what you're doing at the center, isn't it? Julie, tell us more about what the, the Center for Brain Health does and particularly the project that both of you work so much on. And, and of course, that's the Brain Health Project. Well, we are passionate about giving people the tools to one, be able to measure and manage their own brain health. So that looks like taking a brain health index. We have, um, we've done that in person for many years and we have now with the Brain Health Project are choosing to scale that so that more people can have access to it and they can take these assessments online. Um, in addition to that, we have cognitive training that we have uh, really worked to show people cognitive strategies, things you can do in your everyday life. Um, and that training used to be, we still do that in person here, but largely we've put that online so that people can access that through um, our online platform. Well, that's absolutely amazing. So, because I remember looking into this a few years ago and you really had to register and, and there might've even been a, a charge. So now you're scaled this up and anybody in the world can participate? Yes, we actually have people in all 50 states and in over 41 countries that are currently participating. We've got over 17,000 um, registered. And really, um, as long as you're generally healthy, there's a few screening questions in the beginning to make sure of that, because really the point of this research study is to understand potential and performance and how far can we push really brain fitness. So what type of time commitment, if I wanted to be a part of this project, would I have to plan on? We say on average about, you know, 15 minutes a week, um, five minutes a day. It's really, you can get out of it as much or as little as you choose. The nice thing about it too, is that it's not additive. So we're not giving you homework on top of your already busy life. We're just saying, here's ways you can change up um, the way you're approaching your day, the way you're taking in information, um, the way you're using your brain, um, just to do it a little bit differently in a way that is going to be healthier for you long-term. Jen, I know that you work in, in your practice with a lot of veterans, as well as active military personnel, first responders. What are some of the, what, what, what do you do with them? So we engage in workshops where we have an experiential understanding of habits that we already have and then ways that we could possibly change things up. One of the biggest things that we teach people is about single tasking. 
And you can imagine everybody that I've worked with, everybody feels like multitasking is kind of the way to go. And the more I do, the more I get done, but it's actually very toxic for our brain. This is a myth. We used to think that multitasking was good. So by being able to dispel some of that through an experience, also providing brain health literacy on top of that, we slowly teach these incremental improvements to our life. And single tasking is one of those examples that with all of these populations is pretty mind blowing. I, I get to a degree what you're saying, but tell me you know, really in a, in a short, succinct statement, why is multitasking so bad? Because it seems like in this life that we're living in now, we're being bombarded with so many different messages, especially with our video screens. Uh, how can I not multitask? Well, multitasking is really toxic for us because it increases our levels of cortisol, which is our stress hormone. And who needs more of that? We also, it decreases our amount of dopamine, which is our reward neurotransmitter. It significantly reduces the potential of our frontal networks to work as efficiently as possible. Those are the CEOs of our brain. And even though people think that they are doing more, the performance output is pretty dramatic. We are slower, more um, error prone, more superficial in our thinking, less likely to come up with new innovative ideas. And so doing less is actually more. So how can I train my already perhaps wired brain that multitasking is something that I live with? How can I train my brain not to do that? We talk about incremental improvement. Even if you will do 10% less multitasking every day, you'll be doing something good for your brain. What does that look like? We talk about turning off to your point when you have our screens on, turning down the plethora of windows and just keeping on the one window that you're working on silencing your phone, turning off email notifications when you're working on something, making sure that you dedicate some time to not being interrupted or distracted so that you can push forward on tasks that are important to you. So there's incremental ways to do this. So there's a, a word that I uh, learned about in getting ready to meet and talk with both of you, and that was the brain's neuroplasticity. What is that? Neuroplasticity is your brain's ability to change based on how you use it, meaning that um, it is malleable and changeable. And so I love you gave the example of, you know, what can I do? I've, I've built a distracted brain or I'm used to kind of operating in this mode. And so the good news is that, you know, the brain you have is this brain that you've built based on what you've done every day, but based on what you choose to do today and every day going forward, you can actually change those pathways, those connections. Um, and the more you practice something, the stronger those connections become. So we're talking about brain health. How do you measure it? What, what equipment? Are, are you using an MRI? And is it a different form of MRI than what I'm accustomed to when I, I've had my knee MRI? <laughs> So right now we're using the Brain Health Index, which I mentioned earlier, and this is just an online set of assessments. So you can take this in the comfort of your own home on a computer, phone, or tablet. Um, as a part of our research, we are incorporating brain imaging. And the idea is that um, a smaller subset of individuals will have that brain imaging and we'll be able to, from that, create an algorithm really that can then apply to those who do only take the online assessments. So you'll get more information about um, the more structural and functional levels of the brain. Um, but when we're talking about health, you know, we really care about, um, it's one thing to look at things like blood flow and connectivity, um, but what really matters is how you're functioning in your day to day. And so that's really what the index is able to capture and help you understand what are your strengths, um, where are your opportunities to, to focus and grow and what can you be doing each day? So you're talking about this brain index. Is that really what we're going to be looking at in the 21st century as the IQ? Yeah, we're trying to get people to move away from this notion of IQ. I think along with that, the stigma that, you know, you kind of just are born with what you've got or you're stuck at this certain level. And we really want people to understand that there is no ceiling, um, that because of neuroplasticity and because there's so much more that we've learned about how to form healthy habits, what things about lifestyle and environment, um, that you really can change that. So the index, the most exciting thing about it is that it's dynamic and your brain changes all the time. So we encourage people to take it every six months um, to be able to track progress. And you'll know, um, you know, through different phases of life, different seasons, um, the way that that looks and what you can do about it. 
So as some of our viewers know, I'm an avid cyclist, and unfortunately I've seen too many people who have had serious brain injuries because of cycling. And I've heard that the first year after an accident such as that, a major concussion is so important. Is that accurate that the first year is key and is that changing? It, it is definitely, our brains undergo a lot of spontaneous recovery. We have a lot of rehabilitation programs, but the really important part of that is that our window doesn't close at a year. And so we've seen a lot of people over the years think that what I've gained back over at one year time is all I'm gonna get. And that is not the truth. The more that you put into it, the more you can get out of it. Like Julie said, neuroplasticity, driving your brain to change by your experiences, it still continues even in traumatic brain injuries and concussions. Well, we've all heard about the 10,000 steps. I mean, I have my watch right here. Have I made my 10,000 steps today? I don't think so. Are there any tricks like that, that, that we should all be following to, on a regular basis, improve our brain health? We, yes, we have our own formula that we think if people will think about two plus five plus seven. So what is that? It is very much like your 10,000 steps, your eight glasses of water, things that you're striving to achieve. Two is having two things every day where you're doing some expansive, deeper level thinking. You're really trying to move something forward through problem solving or organizing, or you're putting your brain power into it. The five are brain breaks. So people say, a brain break? You know, what, what do I, how do you take a brain break? And my brain doesn't need a break. Our brains need a break, just like our physical body. A brain break is three to five minutes, five times a day of disconnection from technology and people. So you're just leveraging silence to let your default mode network kind of do its aha moment, innovative thinking, but also just to calm your brain down. And then seven is seven times that you're innovative. Innovative is really flexibility of thinking. So you're looking at something from a different perspective. You're tackling something in a new way. You're really doing something different or recognizing the multitude of options that are available to you. So here's a question I have. I mean, you, you've, you've created this pool of, of information and perhaps you have a whole team from a corporation doing it. I don't know if I want my colleagues to know what my brain index is. Is it confidential? Yes, everything we do is confidential. So we have some, you know, kind of nested studies called Brain Healthy Workplace, where we're working with teams of individuals who work together, everything across the whole project, as well as in these studies when you're working with groups, all confidential and private. We um, have a certificate of confidentiality. We are overseen by the Institutional Review Board at the university. And we take that very seriously. So to combine, you both have had such considerable experience. I'll ask both of you this. Uh, Jen, you go first. What is the most exciting revelation that has happened, say, in the last decade? The idea that your brain changes. And I think a that we have the ability to change even in health. And that is something that most people don't even give a second thought to, because if my brain's fine, then my brain's fine. Mm -hmm. We have an ability to change it, go forward and backward every single day. And so I think in the, last de in the last decade, more people understanding that what I do matters for my brain has been in incredible. Julie, what do you have to add on that? Yeah, I would say with the advances in technology allowing us not only to really get inside our heads really see what's going on in the brain but also that's you know the advances in technology that allow us to connect and disseminate this information um, to get it into the hands of more people that otherwise just wouldn't know um, that there's things they can do i think largely um, the majority of people just think that, you know, there's nothing they can do. And so I think it's exciting to me to not only see those scientific advances, but also see it, um, the wide reach that we're able to have um, that really is happening in real time. Whereas previously, you know, it takes generations for that to trickle down or make its way into policy. And so now it's like we really can learn these things in real time along with these experts. Now, I noticed and I mentioned this in my introduction that both of you are trained in speech language pathology. Why is that so important? And how does that affect your career? Uh, Jen, take it away. 
So speech language pathology is really encompasses cognition as well as communication. And when we get into that, we're looking at brain function. Language is the window into the brain. And so how we're able to understand what people are perceiving, understanding, comprehending, and how they express their ideas, it's not just at a word or sentence level, though. It's concepts and ideas. And that's really where, when we get into how people use information, we've seen many people who've had strokes where they have aphasia or apraxia, and yet their communication, their language itself, is actually still very much intact despite having some semantic or syntactic deficits. So I want to encourage our, our viewers to take a look at your website because you have some remarkable speeches uh, that and presentations have been given over the last few years. And one of them showed how the brain lights up different areas of the brain uh, according to different stimuli. And that language and words are not always required to do that. And I, I think of language as the as a doorway to thinking. And that's not necessarily the case, is it? Yeah, it, it, there are, I mean, we are multimodal, right? We have all these senses, all these different inputs that our brain is taking in and synthesizing and making sense of the world. Um, what's interesting though, when it comes to the way we measure things or our medical system or how we do this, um, the way we measure cognition is through speech and language, be, reading and writing. Those are the ways that we kind of assess and measure it. There are some that, that are able to do that without um, using language in that way, but we, I think we have, a way to go in terms of ways that we're able to do that. Here's a, a trivia question for you, and I'm really curious to know if this is true, because it would be something that a grandchild might ask, ask a, a grandfather. Why does the brain have wrinkles? Julie, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, the brain is incredible in terms of the amount of energy it takes up and just the space and the sheer number of connections and neurons that are there. So um, by kind of folding in on itself and creating those wrinkles, it's creating a lot more um, different surface area, different space. And so if you were actually to stretch that out, it would be um, way bigger. I don't know how many times bigger than it, than it is all folded up like that, but yeah, it just allows for just those connections. Hmm. So when we're watching, that's, that's amazing. While we're watching TV, we often see advertisements for brain supplements, especially for the shows that I tend to watch. Are they worthwhile? There hasn't been a lot of evidence. Um, FDA approved that these supplements actually really do very much. Plus, there's a lot to say for placebo effect. I think what's really important when it comes to what you're putting in your body is how you eat and um, thinking about that more in the whole foods and not just one single food, but kind of the incorporated ways. There's lots of great resources and cookbooks now and availability around specific types of more healthy diet. And well, I'll go a little bit farther on that because I saw that, believe it or not, 25% of um, the Americans take various brain supplements. So should I be eating more berries, fish a few times a week, or specifically, what are you talking about when you are mentioning diet? There's a lot of evidence that talks toward the Mediterranean diet. So looking at healthy fats, fish, nuts, berries, um, olive oil, avocado. Uh, so thinking about that, but also getting a kind of grandma's plate of very colorful foods and eating lots of leafy greens and blueberries and, you know, even dark chocolate can be good for you. So I think it's a lot about how we eat more than what kind of pills we're pushing. That's great advice. Well, we have just a few minutes remaining, and I want to be sure that all of us know how we can get involved in the project. So, Julie, how, how would I do that? So you can go to thebrainhealthproject.org and um, sign up right on our website. There's also frequently asked questions and lots more information there to just read up on it. But um, yes, that is open to uh, all adults ages 18 to 100. And let me just remind or, or be sure there's, there's no charge. And will I automatically be accepted? Or you said there's some questions, uh, panel questions that I need to respond to? 
Yes, there is. It is a research study. So we do have some screening eligibility criteria that you have to meet, which just basically you're asserting um, that you can read and understand English, you have access to a device, things like that, um, and that you're generally healthy. Um, and there is no charge, um, which may not be forever, but it is free right now. Um, and that's that includes access to the Brain Health Index, the online assessments, our cognitive training, as well as some virtual coaching. Now, we did talk a few minutes ago about what was it, the two, now let's see if I can remember, what was it, the 257? Was that right? That's Good. Right. So, what about people who are constantly doing crossword puzzles or various mathematical games? Um, are, are, should we build that into our, our daily, uh, daily schedule? What you practice is what you get better at. So I think, um, you know, while it's good to stay engaged and to use your brain and to do things you love, if you really enjoy that, um, that's awesome. But also to realize that those things aren't going to generalize or translate into some of those higher order things that you need to do in your life, like managing relationships or finances or, you know, really critical thinking and problem solving. Um, so I think there is no, there's no magic bullet. Um, just doing one, you know, crossword puzzle a day is not going to be enough. It's really, it's all about lifestyle and really understanding um, and doing things that you love and are passionate about. Um, having purpose is another huge one for health and longevity. Now, one thing I saw is that what can be really important is having friends and having socialization. Do you buy into that as well? Absolutely. We um, we know that social support, social connection is one of the number one most protective factors when it comes to um, aging and health and really immunity and that ability to bounce back. Um, so having having those strong, meaningful connections is one of the healthiest, best things that you can do for yourself. So don't be isolated. And I suspect that COVID has really created some challenges for people. Yeah, I mean, we saw alarming rates of depression, anxiety, um, just even people's ability to recover from illness when they had COVID um, and you know didn't have people around them in support. Um, I think that really showed. And so um, I'm loving the way that I think people are really with that understanding of how isolation can hurt us, really making efforts to reconnect, um, whether that be through FaceTime or, or in person, um, whatever that looks like, but really understanding just how that impacts our brain health. So important. Jen, I know you're on the front lines and I'm not asking you to obviously um, take away from any uh, patient privacy, but give me an example, give us an example of just um, an inspiring story of where someone has come to you and you've been able to make a, a real difference in their life. Okay, so I worked with an active duty um, military operator, service, mem service member, somebody who had had repeated concussions and you know blast, was not having an easy time in life. Relationships were raveled, um, frayed, stressful situations also not being deployed became a source of stress because of boredom and um, lack of purpose but just a general malaise and um, low level confidence in his own skills we did with him an in-person brain health index and we really started to look and be able to show and highlight to him it's not necessarily about the thing we always beat ourselves up about the things that we can't do. We never give ourselves the credit for what our brain continues to do all day long. And so even though he might have forgotten his keys a couple of days, the things that he was able to accomplish and the problems that he was able to solve and the kinds of resourcefulness that he exhibited, those are things that he doesn't really think about. So I think in one way, one of the biggest improvements that we made, one of the biggest impacts we made for him was just being able to qualitatively show him and quantitatively show him that he still has so much potential. It wasn't all just downhill. We also gave him tools. And so when he returned to his um, environment, even before and between deployments, he actually had some tools to work on his own relationships, to think about and reframe his work a little bit differently made a huge difference. And he became somebody who was had a lot of anxiety and depression to somebody who is really thriving in his life within a matter of months. Both of you must find this so rewarding to, to have an impact like that. 
So as we bring the program to a close, let's just sort of go down the list. Uh, what should people do? How can we get involved? Probably one of the easiest ways is to, like I said, join the project if you qualify for that um, so that you can get access to our training um, and really start to understand how you can be applying these things within your day to day life. Um, there are we also offer um, we have a series called Brain Health Presents. And so these are free talks. We bring in the top scientific experts um, from around the country and around the world. And so we have that series will kick off again um, this fall. So you can register for those. Um, and also, if you're local to the DFW, area we do we have um, various in-person events and ways to um, be active and kind of you know stay in the know of just what are, what is our latest science what are we finding new articles we're publishing um, so you can also join our mailing list and are there other centers around the country that are doing some of the same cutting edge um, advances that you're doing not that look at brain health there are several other centers for center for brain health but they're really looking at siloed disease states. There are some that look at specifically at traumatic brain injury and concussion or Alzheimer's disease. So I think that's what makes us unique is a um, looking at brain health across situations across the lifespan, regardless of what may have been a part of somebody's medical history. And as, as you mentioned, or as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, I really did enjoy watching online some of the presentations that you had that just really well explained and you brought in experts from all across the globe. So I do want to encourage our viewers to, to, uh, to take advantage of, of watching those. And I want to thank both of you to be on the, for being on the program. And you know, I'm, I'm a fan of Agatha Christie, and I bet a lot of you are as well. And here's a great quote, the famed detective Hercule Poirot noted, it's the brain, the little gray cells on which one must rely. And that's absolutely the truth. We're only born with one brain and we need to take every possible opportunity to keep it healthy and to improve our brain health. And I think you both have given us lots of clear ways to, to be able to do that in the coming months. I'm Jim Falk, and you can be sure that we're here at McQuiston talking about things that matter with people who care. Thanks for watching.